Hi, I'm John Young. I lead the uh, M&A group at Solicitors Kings in Napoli. Following on from my recent discussions with James Wood about the difference between completion accounts and lockboxes, I'm here today to discuss with his colleague Neil Shah, head of M&A at Buzzacoff, some of the issues around the format the consideration for the sale of a company can take. Mira, once the parties have agreed on a price in principle, what kind of issues need to be addressed? Hi, John. Thanks and great to be here today. Um, in, in terms of the, the price in, in principle as well, even once that's been agreed, which can vary depending on the type of business, um, most commonly unless kind of asset rich would be on a multiple of either EBITDA or revenue. Even once that's been established, there can be significant areas to negotiate um, with regards to the form of consideration that might be taking place and timings of it. Um, my colleague, colleague James Wood in another video in this series talked about the difference between enterprise value and equity value, the latter being what is ultimately paid out to shareholders and aligns with what I refer to here as consideration. OK, and what might the parties want to consider when they are looking at the consideration? So particularly in less certain trading times, um, both at a macroeconomic level or microeconomic in terms of the business that's being sold itself, more complex structures tend to be agreed or considered on deals. At a very high level, the possible structure of consideration can include some or all of the following three types. So number one is all up front i.e. on day one, when the transaction completes, that's when the consideration um, transfers over. And secondly, deferred, i.e. there's no contingent element, it's simply a delay in timing across future periods. That can be quite typically kind of years, but I've also seen it be sort of months um, following the deal. And then lastly, contingent, i.e. contingent on certain future performance elements. This tends to be more typically known as earnouts. And presumably those three models have pros and cons from each side? Absolutely. And the first one I mentioned, the all on day one, is often, but not always, as we'll explore in a moment, the preference from a seller's perspective. It gives that sort of more easily walk away um, ability post-transaction, reducing the amount of uncertainty afterwards. The second one, in terms of deferred consideration, can be helpful as well particularly with the lens of the buyer, so from a cash flow perspective. If there are funding requirements in order to make the consideration payments, for example, deferred consideration gives a little bit more time to build up that funding and to make, make the consideration payments. And I guess that, that brings a point for the other side, which is that if somebody needs the money to make the payments, then you've got to think about credit risk with the buyer. Um, if you haven't received the money on day one, you can never be 100% sure that you'll get it. Absolutely. And one of the things we always speak to our clients about on the sales side, the first questions is, is the buyer in funds or how readily available are those funding elements of it? Um, because not only does it factor into your appetite for doing a deal with them, but it will feature into timeline as well. That's great. And then what about earnouts? How do they work? So earnouts typically include any number of qualitative and quantitative conditions which are required to be met in order for the relevant payments to be made. There are a whole host of examples, but just to give a few typical types that we see, it could be achieving a certain metric. So your gross margin um, that's forecast, your EBITDA margin um, targets, or winning a certain number of new clients, perhaps on a trade sale, your common clients that you'll be targeting together. And the other category we tend to see, um, particularly for tech businesses where that product was a key factor behind the purchase is, has that launch of the new tech product actually been achieved? And that being one of the factors contingent on a payment being made. That's that's really interesting. So when would uh, when would the parties want to use an earn out as opposed to just trying to fix the price up front, maybe with a, a completion adjustment like I discussed with James? Absolutely. I think more often than not, and particularly we've seen a ramp up in the trend of earnouts being used um, in the last few years is where there's a gap in valuation expectations, um, i.e. sellers expecting more, um, buyer doesn't necessarily see, see that. And, and so actually it really works well to bridge that gap. Um, it also works well where the future performance of the selling business is expected to ramp up significantly in the future. So actually you can align the consideration to those expectations. Which is, is absolutely great when there's performance, but I guess from my perspective as, as the lawyer, particularly for a seller, 
what I'm always concerned about is the protections that they might need. Um, earnouts are, are very susceptible to manipulation potentially if proper protections aren't in place. So we need to understand the expectations of the parties and uh, there needs to be an agreement as to the level of control and freedom that the sellers will have to, to hit those earnout targets as opposed to the buyer's desire to bring them into the, the family of their existing business and um, have them do things the buyer's way, which can be can be a challenge sometimes. Definitely. And you touched on something really important there in terms of if you are planning to, to use an earn out in your deal and whether you're buy side or sell side, from an advisor's perspective, it's making sure there are as many examples within there as possible. And um, you talked about kind of who will have control over certain elements. But I think also having examples written in there to say in this scenario, this is how we would interpret the definitions, the specific accounting policies to make sure that both parties before any deal was signed, understand commercially what may happen in any one scenario. I think also just agreeing the process post deal of how those conditions will be regularly tracked as opposed to waiting, for example, a year later, and then everyone looking back at reminding themselves of what the SBA said. If you agree a regular cadence in terms of tracking that and who will be responsible, it can really help to get ahead of issues um, before they become any um, at the point in time you're measuring it. That sounds like a, a really helpful tactic for, for parties to adopt, no matter which side they're on. Um, what about types of consideration? Because it doesn't just have to be cash. What, what options are there when people are thinking about how they're going to be paid? Exactly. So timing and contingency aside, consideration could take the form in cash, um, shares, and, and there'll be specific rights attached to those shares, which I'll come, up, come on to, or a mixture of the two. The use of shares as a type of consideration is more common for listed companies, but we have also seen this in many private company transactions. So in terms of the use of shares as a type of consideration, from the buyer's perspective, it can allow incentives to align more closely and for all parties for there to be a more of a collaborative approach in terms of achieving success for the wider group. Um, so for sellers, both those shareholders, as well as the wider leadership team um, who will be pivotal in the next stage of growth of the business, they can directly benefit and contribute to the value creation as part of the wider group. So it can work really well. On the downside, there are often conditions attached to those shares in respect of the individual's requirements to stay with the business, as well as often the type of share rights attached so whether you'd have voting or dividend and how the waterfall of shares and returns would fall on an onward exit. It sounds like there are some real risks around um, around taking shares as consideration which parties need to bear in mind and, and perhaps slightly discount them as they're as they're thinking um, about what their overall return is going to be. Um, yeah, I would agree. And I think it's why often cash is preferred to shares, certainly when we're advising our clients on the sell side, um, because of the difficulties and the nuances with any shares being part of consideration. Cash is ultimately king, your most liquid asset, uh, and, and therefore having that level of certainty is preferable. I think the last thing to, to touch on in terms of types of consideration um, is that tax advice should be sought. Um, as to the implications of receiving any non-cash consideration, because there are additional levels of complexity to consider. Thanks, Mira. This is obviously a subject which has a lot of depth, and that was a great short introduction, which I think will be really helpful for, for viewers. And uh, for people watching, if you are thinking about selling or buying a company, please don't hesitate to get in touch. It's crucially important to make sure that you get uh, proper professional advice right at the start when you're actually considering uh, how the consideration is going to be structured and negotiating how much it's going to be. It's much, much easier to get this right at, uh, at the very beginning than try and patch it uh, to make it work as the transaction develops once you've actually got large documents which have been drafted. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you.